Hey, you are listening to Sean of the South. We're coming to you live via the radio, the podcast airwaves from here all over the nation. That means to hear behind me right now is Brandon Lee Adams, everybody. Brandon Lee Adams. Reads a little bit of our mail, a little bit of our mail tonight. Our first message comes from Heather, daughter of a redhead in Alabama. Sean, my father had red hair and he grew up in what I fondly call backwoods, Alabama. He loved my mom, he loved me, Southern cooking and all burned football. He was a good man and he went to heaven five years ago at the young age of 62. I know he would have loved to read your blogs and listen to your shows that would have taken him back to his childhood. You mentioned filling stations recently, and I remember riding in my dad's truck as a little girl visiting filling stations all over the place. My dad would often leave filling stations with a full tank of gas, a bottle of Diet Coke, and a Pepsi, and a pack of peanuts. He loved to pour those peanuts in his Coke. I have two boys that my father luckily got to meet before he left us. The oldest starts college in a couple weeks. He was daddy's first grandchild. I'm an only child, and I carry his name. The youngest has striking red hair. He's going into seventh grade and has football tryouts next week. Thanks again, your friend Heather. Shane DeMayer, Austin, Texas. I'm with my daughter on her last week before school starts and we rent a lake cabin. And we're all just hanging out, eating hamburgers and fishing and stuff. And I just wanted to tell my family that I love them and I'm gonna miss our awesome summer together. It was a good one. Ryan McAdams, Pasadena, California. My mother still lives in Alabama, but I do not, and I just miss her extra special tonight. She was a big supporter of me and my new job, so I just wanted to throw a shout out to her. Mama, thanks for standing behind me. I miss you, I miss you bad. Erica Huddle Bowman, Lincoln, Nebraska. My son is eight. We were at the mall just walking around and he got lost. So he went into the lingerie store because he said, because he said the pictures of the girls in the windows made him feel like it would be really safe in there. When security finally found me, I was frantic and I was freaking out. 
And they took me to the lingerie store, and there were all these very pretty, very young girls just doting on him. And he was like, Mom, you can just leave me here. I'm, on, I'm good. That boy is going to be a handful. Rhonda Simpson, Amarillo, Texas. Sean, I wanted to invite you to our family reunion. We always do it the first week in August, and I'm sure you're probably not going to be anywhere near here, but on the off chance that you are, we'd love to have you. We do a brisket barbecue, which is very different than the Deep South barbecue, which is all pork. But I promise it'll be well worth your time if you're around these parts. Come on and be a Simpson for a day. You won't regret it, but your waistline might. <laughs> Dear Rhonda, thank you for the invite. I do love me a little bit of brisket. Sarah Ann Moss, Chattanooga, Tennessee. When my husband met me, we were students, and I turned him down for date requests at least four times, maybe five. I can't remember. He wasn't what I thought I was into, I'll be honest. I thought I wanted something else in a man, something, something different. But when I finally gave in, it was a date that I'll never forget. He borrowed his brother's antique Chevy truck to pick me up. It was green, and he wore a tuxedo, a nice one, and he brought flowers and everything. It was like he knew he had this one shot at winning me over, and so he was going to go all out and make it as big as he could, and he did. We went to a pond out in the country, and he'd hired one of his friends to play the guitar, and we ate on a white tablecloth, and when he asked me to dance, I said, no, nah, I really don't know how because I'm not much of a dancer. And he said, that's okay, I'm not much of a dancer either. We've been married 18 years, and that big goofy man made me, and that big goofy man made me fall for him, and I'm sorry I ever turned him down. I was a stupid girl. Please tell my hubby Chase that I love him. Chase, I hope you got all that. Mark Monroe, Fife, Alabama. Sean, I love your podcast. I listen every week. You and I have a lot in common. I love Tulane Rose. My daughter is now 22, fixing to get married in September. When she was little, we would go on vacation on trips, and I'd stop at mom and pop restaurants, and she'd say, why do you always stop at these little hole-in-wall places? And I'd just laugh. And I'd say, honey, because that's where the best food is. Dear Mark Monroe, amen to that, brother. Amen to that. Sherry Woods, La Ciudad, Mexico. Sean, I'm in Mexico City with a friend. We've been here for two years working in a church. We were only going to stay for a short bit, but we felt like we could be of use here, and so we just fell in love with the culture. However, we still miss Alfreda, Georgia, where we're originally from. And your show takes us home every week, and I just want to say thanks for that. Also, hello to my sweet grandkids, Justin and Tallulah Grace. Te amo, te amo mucho, Justin and Tallulah. Cody Springfield, Spartanburg, South Carolina. Sean, I found a wallet this week, and I almost had 300 bucks in it. I found a guy's address on his driver's license, and, and I took it to his house. He lived across town. He wasn't home, though. So I left it on his front door with a little note with my phone number on it. Later that night, I got this text, and it said, in all caps, Thank you. You saved my life, dude. You saved my life. Anyway, I haven't wanted to tell my friends about that because I didn't want them to think I was humble bragging. So I'm telling you, the faceless guy in my phone who I listen to sometimes. Dear Corey, I'm so glad you told me. So glad. Gregory Houston, Missoula, Montana. My grandson is turning 19 today, and I have been racking my brain to think of something interesting that I could do for him. The older they get, the harder it is to do special things. This might not ever reach his ears, but since he is the one who introduced me to your show, I hope he happens to be listening right now. And if he is, please say, Jordan, I love you, and I'm so proud of you for getting through high school. Those are the hardest years. Once you've got them licked, they're over. Dear Gregory, you got it. Jordan, replay that again if you need to hear what I just said. <laughs> Kathy, Ozark, Alabama. Hey, Sean, this is Kathy. We went and listened to you at Ozark Methodist Church not very long ago. I was just wondering if you'd please tell Alan happy birthday on your show. We listen every week, and I think he'd get a kick out of it if you told him happy birthday on your show. Keep doing what you do. You have a very special way with words. Thanks, and roll tide. Dear Alan, happy birthday from everybody here tonight. Happy birthday. 
And that's letters from our listeners. We're going to have another tune here from Brandon Lee Adams. Brandon Lee Adams, everybody. What were you doing in my dreams last night? Thought I'd drank you off my mind. Should have known you'd come back around. Cause you're not the leaving kind. Think I'll go and catch that southbound train. Right across that county line. If your memory won't let me be, think I'll go out of my mind. Memories that won't go away Must be the hardest kind No matter how you try to drown them out They have no respect for place for time We had a beautiful rain this week. Summer rain started this week off on Monday. Monday morning I woke up and it was nothing but rain. I'd seen it coming in on Sunday night. I looked off into the distance. The sky had gone from a blue to a dark gray. I like a summer rain. I like to wake up to a summer rain. There's something about a summer rain that is different than a spring rain or a fall rain. A summer rain is the kind of rain that is not foreboding or looming with dark and ugly terrifying clouds. A summer rain is accompanied with graceful clouds, clouds that, that seem to come out of nowhere and form and do a dance in the sky. And they just, they light up the sky rather than make it dark. It's a, it's a very bright gray. The world is actually a little bit brighter during a summer rain than it is in full sunlight. Uh, an artist friend of my mother's told me that. She said, if you go outside with a light meter and you hold it up above your head, during a summer rain, you can see that the world is actually a lot brighter than if the world were covered in sun. I don't know many people who'd be willing to go outside in the summer rain and hold up a light meter, but this woman was absolutely nuts, so I, I don't doubt for a moment that she'd actually done that. Summer rains of my childhood were always accompanied by sitting on the porch with my father. He would sit on the porch swing shirtless like some... some God-fearing hillbilly. And he'd whittle a stick. He'd whittle a stick with his little case pocket knife, a yellow pocket knife with a tiny worn-out blade that was no bigger than, than your pinky. And he'd whittle that stick 
He could make all sorts of silly things. He could make little figurines of, of Labrador retrievers. He could make a propeller. He could make a propeller, and then he'd mount it on another stick he'd been carving. Summer rains, they, they inspire greatness among common men. And nowhere is this more evident than, than when you're sitting on the porch. People say things that you wouldn't expect them to say because they're, they're caught up in a moment of reflection, because you can do nothing during a summer rain. Whereas when the weather is perfect and beautiful, you can always get outside and you can work. But when it's raining, you can only sit on your porch and listen to the millions of pounds of water pelt the millions of acres which sit before you. And this causes men to say things, things you can't say when you're busy working outside, sweating to death. But now I'm a married man, and married men do not get the luxury of sitting on a porch. <laughs> no, it's true. It's true. Married men, married men have to go into town and buy things, or they have to complete things on their honeydew list. You see... A honeydew list is a list which has been accumulating since the day of your birth. If you're a man. And this list is added to with at least five items every day. Five items every day are added to your list. And by the time you die, your list will be longer than an unfurled roll of Scott's toilet paper. <laughs> my list has been growing and growing and growing. And my father used to tell my mother, he'd say, Honey, ain't no need. Ain't no need for you to keep nagging me about this. He'd say, once you've told a man to do it, he'll do it. He'll do it. And there is no need to nag him for six months about it. <laughs> With my wife now, she has a long list for me. And, and on a rainy day, when you are stuck inside as a married man, that means you are in close proximity to your wife. Thus, sitting around on your keister is not an acceptable form of passing the day away. No, sir. No, sir. Not when you've got a list which is accumulating while you are sitting there watching the rainfall. No, sir. You better get up and disappear if you want to, want to continue being married. So I got up and I went into town. Went into town. First thing I did was get a haircut. I've been needing a haircut for a long time. I'm lazy when it comes to cutting hair, and so my hair gets kind of shaggy looking. And the first person to notice this is my wife. I walked in to this barber shop a friend had been telling me about. I'd never been there before. It was clear on the other side of town. Walked in, and I saw a, an old barber's chair sitting, sitting right there in the center of the shop. It stood out from all the other chairs. It was old. Was old, and the man standing behind it was a little man about five foot two with pure white hair and cobby features. He was a stout man, and his name was Spock. Spock. Spock is from Lafayette, Louisiana, and he talks like it. He's got a Cajun accent so thick I could hardly understand him, and the Cajuns have their own words for everything. And they always say the word she, mache, after their sentences. Oh, how you doing today, mache? Come on up here, Mache. Get your hair cut. Get your hair cut, boy. I could hardly understand him, but he was a sweet man, and he laughed too much. He laughed so much that his face would frequently turn purple. <laughs> he was the kind of old man who'd tell jokes. Old men can be divided up into two sections. There are grumpy and bitter old men who wake up and they're angry, probably because they've had years of honeydew lists accumulating. Maybe even for multiple wives, God forbid. <laughs> and then there's the kind of man who tells a joke. This is the kind of man who learns to enjoy life. This is the kind of man I'd like to be one day. Oh, Spike told me all sorts of jokes. He told me a joke about the, the man who was walking along the country road. He was walking along the country road late at night, and a semi-truck from out of nowhere came and it pinned him against a tree. It hit him so hard it pinned him up against an oak tree. A little while later, a police officer came down that road and he saw the man pinned against the tree and the truck. And the police officer draped a wool blanket over the man and he said, Sir, are you comfortable? And the man said, yeah, I make a nice living. 
And of course, there's the joke about the two old men sitting in the nursing home. They're sitting out there in a park bench, and along comes a pigeon, and the pigeon commits an, an act of indiscretion on the old man's head. This big old pile of white and gray falls from the sky and splatters right on the old man's head. And the other old man looks at him and he says, Oh my God, stay right here while I go get, go get some toilet paper. And the other old man says, Are you nuts? Do you know by the time you get back here with that toilet paper, that pigeon's going to be long gone from here. <laughs> and there's the joke about the man who went hunting. The man who went hunting in the woods, he was hunting for deer. And while he was hunting, he heard some rustles in the bushes behind him. And he turned and he looked. And he saw a 12-foot-tall bear reared up. And his paws were as big as hands. And the bear was showing his teeth. And the man threw his gun down and he dropped to his knees and he said, Dear Lord, if you are there, please God, make that bear a Baptist Christian bear. And that bear reached into his back pocket and he pulled out a handkerchief and he tied it around his neck as a bib. And that bear got down on his knees. He said, Bless us, O Lord, for these five gifts which we are about to receive. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Which you will note is not a Baptist prayer, but actually an Episcopal one. <laughs> yes, he told these jokes, and I just loved him because with each joke he'd laugh a little bit more, and his, his tolerance for a good joke would go down, and his laughter would get even heavier until he was shaking his scissors in such an unsteady manner I wasn't sure he'd be able to cut my hair at all. And he talked about his family. I looked on his counter there. I saw pictures of his grandkids, and I saw pictures of his children. He told me about his children, about growing up in Lafayette, and how he'd, he'd hung drywall with his brothers before he decided to go to school to get his barber's license and follow in his father's footsteps, and how he'd been a barber for most of his life in that barber's chair I was sitting in that dated back to 1941 when his father opened his first barber shop in Lafayette, Louisiana. But to tell you the truth, I really couldn't understand but about 25% of what Spock said because he had such a thick Cajun accent. I could hardly, I could hardly decipher his words. But when he finished, he spun me around and looked look at my own reflection in the mirror, and it was one of the nicest haircuts I'd ever had. And that's saying something because I was born a redhead with curly hair. And, and there's no easier hair to mess up than a redhead with curly hair because every mistake you make is amplified by at least 17 times because red hair reflects the light just a little bit differently. But this was a good haircut, and I walked up to that, that cash register. I paid him his money. It was very cheap. I tipped him as best I could. And he said, thank you. Thank you, boy. And he said it in his tongue, his Cajun, Acadian tongue. He said, bien merci, boy. I asked him to teach that to me. He said, bien merci. Bien merci. And so I butchered that little phrase and I said it to him, bien merci. And he laughed and he said, oh, c'est pas rien, monsieur. C'est pas rien. I have no idea what that means. I have no idea what that means, but I know how to say thank you. Bien merci. Got to pick up my truck. It was still raining pretty good. It was raining something fierce, summer rain. And I drove to the hardware store, to the hardware store. And the hardware store, whenever I go there, I always see about 55 people that I know. They're either people I've grown up with or they're people that I have worked with in the past or people I've gone to church with. I shook about a dozen hands, and then I shook about a dozen more, and then I got to see cell phone pictures of grandkids and cell phone pictures of children. And I got to hear about who, who is getting married to who and who is dating who and who is divorced from who, who, who is running around on who. There's all sorts of gossip you can hear at the hardware store. And I walked along. I went to the, to the aisle that sells refrigerator gasket. Our refrigerator has been kind of acting up. And so I, I did what the refrigerator repairman told me to do on the phone. He said, put a $100 bill between your gasket and your door and shut it. And if you can pull that $100 bill out with no resistance, then that means you need a new gasket. Well, the only problem is someone like me don't have any $100 bills laying around, so I did the dollar bill test. 
course, uh, my gasket's completely shot, it turns out. There was no resistance. That dollar bill just slid right out. And so I went to the hardware store. I was walking around, and I got immediately held up by Bill Weaver. Bill Weaver wanted to tell me all about his gallstones. <laughs> Bill Weaver's about 76 years old. He just kind of hangs out at this hardware store. And once one man starts talking about his gallstones, the, the whole conversational floor is opened up for all the other older men to come and tell you about the ailments. And there's nothing older men love than to talk about the ailments. It's like, it's like chickens gathering around a June bug. Once one man starts talking about it, another man comes and he starts talking about it. And good Lord, once the first old man mentions the word prostate, <laughs> all the other old men have something to say about it, and it's, it's vile, crude conversation. I don't wish it on my worst enemy. So I kind of removed myself from, from a conversation that Bill Weaver had started. And I was walking the aisles looking for a refrigerator gasket, and I passed the aisle that had electrical stuff in it, and I saw a man pushing a cart, and he had a boy with him, and that boy had Down syndrome. They were laughing, they were laughing like they was in their own little world. That boy was just a grinning at his father. His father was just a grinning at his boy. And they were laughing, and I can tell the difference between, between, between forced laughter and genuine laughter. This was genuine. It really was. And I became so entranced in what they were doing that I was kind of following around the store. And then I heard this loud voice behind me, the mouth of the South, Don Robertson was behind me. <laughs> Don Robertson's an old man with silver hair, and he always wears the same, same outfit, a little denim shirt tucked into jeans with a belt buckle and boots. And every year, Don Robertson gets a pair of hearing aids for his birthday. And every year, Don Robertson's voice goes up by about three decibels. <laughs> Talks a little bit louder and a little bit louder until one day when I assume he reaches 85, he will talk loud enough to affect the daggum weather. <laughs> the mouth of the south. He used to sing in the church choir. He sang first tenor. And he sang notes that are not available on the western scale of music. <laughs> notes that no man within three counties had ever heard before. Whatever notes they were, they certainly aren't located in the Baptist temple. <laughs> Don Robertson was talking to me, and he was telling me things about his son and about his daughter. And I was listening, and I lost track. I lost track of that man and his boy. And I finally saw that man and his boy near the checkout aisle, and I, 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 I inched toward the checkout aisle just one footstep at a time. And Donald Robertson inched toward the checkout aisle one step at a time along with me. And his voice kept getting louder and louder and louder until people in the store was looking at us. And then Donald Robertson mentioned his prostate. <laughs> I did my best to listen to what that man and his boy were talking about in the next aisle. And what I heard was this. I heard, Dad, do you think Mom's having a good day? And I heard that man say, yeah, I reckon she's having a good day, son. I reckon she's having a good day. He said, what if we could make her have a better day by getting her a Mountain Dew? <laughs> and that father smiled and he reached into the cooler. And he pulled out a Mountain Dew. And he threw it into his cart. And then... Once they checked out, I saw that boy, that little boy, walk around, that cashier, without warning, and he gave her a hug, a big old, big old bear hug. And she gave him a hug, too, and apparently they didn't know each other. Apparently they were strangers. That's what I was able to gather. And while I was caught up in this moment of reflection, Mr. Donald Robertson's voice was just ringing in my ears. He was saying, did you know that my wife's mother had a gallstone, which was roughly the size of a football, <laughs> removed from her, from her gallbladder? <laughs> and this drew men from all corners of the store. They all kind of meandered toward him. One man was carrying a walker. Another man was carrying a little cane. And they all gathered around him, and the other man said, yeah, that ain't nothing. That ain't nothing. And so it went... And I was able to pay for my stuff and just kind of make a smooth departure out of the store. I got to hear about, 
I got to hear from my friends in the parking lot on the way to my truck. I saw my buddy Alan I used to work with. And he said he just got married. And I got to see another friend of mine, and he pulled out his cell phone, and he showed me pictures of his, his brand-new daughter. She's just born last week. I got in my truck, and I drove to the supermarket because my wife has texted me a list. You see, sometimes I get messages from people who ask me little tidbits about marriage. Uh, I got a message this morning from a boy named Paul in Marietta, Georgia. Paul wanted to know what it was like to be married because he's about to be married in the next few weeks. Paul, if you're listening now via the podcast airwaves or, or the radio or, or anybody out here in this audience tonight, marriage is a whole lot more than a lot, a lot of people think it is. A lot of people think it's about companionship and love and, and children and for better, for worse stuff and for richer, for poorer stuff. But it's a whole lot more than that. Marriage, you see, is an epic, never-ending, lifelong struggle about what is for dinner. <laughs> and yes, your wife, she wants to know what's for dinner. This is just how women are created. The epic, never-ending struggle of what's for dinner is always there beneath, beneath the foundation of any good, solid marriage. <laughs> Many world wars... And many international conflicts could have been solved if one smart man would have approached his wife while carrying a carton of ice cream with two spoons shoved in it (laughs) and said, you know what, how about ice cream for dinner tonight? So I rode through those aisles with my shopping cart and I got the things my wife wanted. She wanted chicken, flour, peanut oil, and okra, and celery, and Duke's mayonnaise, and peaches, and when I got to the checkout aisle, I saw, I saw a girl in the checkout aisle. She was about 18 years old. She wore a scarf around her bald head. And with her was her little brother and her father. And I introduced myself to her because she was such a beautiful, vibrant young girl. And she had freckles just like I do. See, people like me who were born with buckshot freckles... We wandered through life wondering what it might be like to have pretty skin. She was fair-skinned, just like me, and she had a little bit of a sunburn, just the faintest hint of a sunburn. That's because she's from Bowling Green, Kentucky, and she's only down here for the next four days, and she just visited the Gulf of Mexico this week. It was the first time she'd ever seen the Gulf of Mexico in her life. Her name is Julia. Julia. Julia went down to the beach with her family on the sugar white sand and the the emerald green water. And she sat underneath an umbrella with sunscreen on her her buckshot freckled skin. And she watched her little brother and her family play in the water and in the waves. She said, I can't get out in the water because my doctors, they say that my immune system isn't able to handle the bacteria that's found in the Gulf water. So I had to stay out of the water. But I was okay with me. I just read a little bit. I watched them. They were having fun. When it was time to go, they, they pushed their cart out to the parking lot. She waved goodbye to me. Beautiful, beautiful young 18-year-old Julia. I left that grocery store, and I, I darted through a world that was raining. Uh, the, the summer rain had it started again, and the sky had opened up, and it was pouring something fierce. And I finally got to my truck, and I was just dripping wet. My, my shirt was saturated, my jeans were saturated, my hair was matted to my head. And I just kind of sat there for a little bit watching the, the designs on my windshield, the crisscrossed crystal designs of water forming on my windshield. I, I kind of thought about something I didn't mean to think about while just sitting watching the rain. I thought about how grateful I am. How grateful I am to just be feeling all right today. My mother used to tell me, she'd say, when you get older, you're not going to be able to sleep as good as you used to, and you're you're going to you're going to wake up feeling kind of crotchety, and every day it's just going to be a question of what are you recovering from. Life itself is just a game of recovery. You recover from one thing, and then another thing hits you, and you recover from that other thing, and then another thing hits you. And right then, while I was watching the rain, I was grateful. 
I was grateful for everything. Not just one or two things, but everything. I was grateful for little boys with Down syndrome sent from heaven to teach us what it means to truly love. How to hug a stranger. I thought about men like Donald Robertson, Bill Weaver. Old men, white-haired, who can't hit a tune in a bucket but still sing in the Baptist choir every cotton-picking Sunday. I thought about, I thought about little white-haired barbers named Spike who still cut hair in an old chair that was passed down to them from their father. I thought about men who tell jokes, who laugh too much. Would that I could be such a man. I guess what I'm really trying to say here is bien merci. Thank you. And thank you, everybody here tonight. Hey, thanks for listening to Sean of the South. I've been your host today, Sean Dietrich. And man, it has been a bona fide pleasure, if I do say so myself. Hope you join us next week and the week after that if you ain't got nothing going on. The music you heard behind me today was Brandon Lee Adams, an up-and-coming artist from the Mountain Hills and Valleys of Appalachia, tracing his musical roots from traditional gospel music all the way to folk, bluegrass, jazz, and blues. Recordings he has in his repertoire are with iconic artists like Tony Rice, Carl Jackson, and Scott Vest. He's also appeared on two Grammy-nominated albums and one International Bluegrass Music Association award-winning album, Celebration of Life. Brandon is the man. Check out his music on Spotify, iTunes, Pandora, Facebook, Twitter, and any other platform you can think of, or check out his website, brandonleeadamsmusic.com. Find anything more about what I do, you can visit seanofthesouthshow.com. That's our website that houses all of our shows dating back to the very first one. While you're there, I hope you drop me a line. Tell me about your birthday announcements, wedding announcements, wedding invitations, grandparents' birthday anniversaries, bar mitzvah invitations, and anything else you can think of. Funny stories, sad stories, or anything that's happened to you today that you might not think that matters, but it really does to a whole lot of people who like to laugh, or who like to cry, or who like to just hear about you. And I'll do my best to read them over the air for my friends, because I love to do that sort of stuff for my friends. Speaking of friends, friends, you might think you're lost life sometimes, but if you got somebody with you, well, that means you ain't really lost at all. Adios. Adios.